what are treasures in heaven and what will we do with them? And I thought, wow, to have a high schooler thinking on that realm uh, merits going in front of all those scholarly, uh, more elderly questions that I've been getting. So I thought, and, and I spent this afternoon typing up um, just some thoughts on this. So this evening, what are treasures in heaven? And I, I think what the high schooler was saying is, so why should we devote our life, our energy, our time uh, for those treasures? What are they for? And, and uh, so treasures in heaven are basically, Jesus said, for good and faithful servants. If you want to turn to Matthew 25, and we're going to be looking at a lot of verses tonight, but in Matthew 25, basically, Jesus is ending his public ministry, and he's telling his, his disciples key information. It's kind of like a private briefing from chapter 24 on. There, there is not any more public ministry in the temple and to the crowds, and Jesus now is exclusively focusing on his disciples. And he already taught them, chapter 24, about the future. Now in chapter 25, he tells a series of lessons, parables, parabolic stories. And they're all kind of applying his long sermon in chapter 24. And he does the virgins in chapter 25, and then the talents starting in verse 14. And then, in the midst of the talents, he gives this application in those two verses you see on the screen, verses 21 and 23. And look how Jesus applies his departing from earth, going to heaven, leaving us here to do as the story was. He leaves some of us with this amount and this amount and this amount, and he's coming back to see how we did. And he, he said this, his Lord said to him in verse 21, uh, the one who had five talents and, and gained five more in verse 20. In verse 21, he said, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. So the, the treasures in heaven somehow relate to our, our joy, somehow relate to our faithfulness on earth, and it's measured by the Lord. And he says the same thing uh, with the one who had two in verse 22, he received two talents, uh, said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. I've gained two more talents beside them. I've doubled uh, what you gave me. And his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. Now, basically, a good servant is a servant who did what they were told to do. Jesus already defined that. So good servants do what they're told to do. In fact, a servant is someone who signs on or, or gets taken to do the will of another. But a faithful servant is one who keeps doing it. So a good servant does what they're told. A faithful servant keeps doing. And so these, uh, these lessons are saying, do what you're told to do for me and keep doing them. So that's what treasures in heaven. They are for and, and enter into the joy of your Lord in the context is going to heaven. So heaven is going to be joyful and a lot of what we did on earth is going to follow us in heaven. So that's why we should focus on being good and faithful servants until Christ comes. Jesus tells us that. Because what we do on earth totally matters in heaven and, and will totally be reflective. And so we should focus on being good and faithful servants till Christ comes so we don't waste our lives. Now let me go to the very end of the Bible and go to the very last chapter, chapter 22. So just go to the maps and the concordance and back up to the very last words of the Bible and look at verse 12. Because the Bible ends with Jesus commenting on our high schooler's question about rewards and treasures in heaven and what, what that is all about. And it says in Revelation 22, in verse 12, Jesus is speaking, he says, And behold, I am coming quickly. Now look at this. And my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. Now, of course, in the context, some of those are going to be paid back with flaming fire and vengeance for the lost. But for the believers, this is a, a call to, to invest our lives wisely that, that Jesus has his rewards and he's going to give to every one of us according to what we really did. Not what we said, not, not what we implied, but what we did. So we don't want to waste our life because Jesus is focusing on this. Now, back up to chapter 4, because we saw 
the people that are already there in chapter 4, and you know this, verses 9 and 10, what they're doing with their rewards. And these are believers, and it says in verse 9 of chapter 4 of Revelation, and whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down. Now, these are humans. Uh, these are not angels. They're differentiated between. So these are not uh, created beings that just minister to God. These are redeemed humans because they say you have redeemed us at other times and have purchased us with your blood. And God didn't die for angels and God didn't die for animals. He died for only the descendants of Adam. So these are humans and there are 24 of them representative and we've talked about that of all believers of all ages, the Old and New Testament saints. But they fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and look at this and cast their crowns. So now we've gone from treasures in heaven to rewards, you know, treasures, Matthew 25, rewards, Revelation 22. Now, now they're, they're invisible. And see, that's the first thing that I think this high schooler was asking. What are the treasures? Well, in heaven, it's not like a bank account with, you know, uh, what's the name of that new kind of money that uh, Bitcoin. It's not Bitcoins, you know, kind of digital currency of heaven. It's actual tangible right here. It's each of these elders have something that was given to them. And, and it's, it's called a crown. So starting at the end of the book in Revelation, believers are casting crowns at Christ's feet. Now, uh, and again, I told you we'd be all over the place. Look at Matthew again, chapter 6. Because this is just uh, uh, thinking through this. This is what dialogue is, dialogizomai, um, thinking and reasoning through. Um, what are treasures? Jesus said treasures are the joy that we're going to look forward to for being good and faithful servants. And then he says that the treasures are the rewards he's bringing with him. But when the people get them, they're crowns and they, they are, are offering to him. So now, back to Jesus, Matthew 6. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. So don't distill down your time. Remember, treasures are distilled time. If you, if you carefully plant and cultivate a field and you get a hundredfold return on the crops, you have changed the, the time you invested in that to when you sell your crops, the money is distilled down time. And so your time distilled produces money. So don't use all of your time to distill it down to money on earth. Why? Because moth, if you use some of it to get, to get cloth or clothing, moths will get it. Or if you buy things, uh, rust will destroy it. Or no matter what it is, thieves will break in and steal. Verse 20. But distill your time to purchase for yourselves treasures in heaven. Now part of that is, remember money is the, is the reflection of time. And so the Lord, actually, he, what he wants is he wants us to give him, his, give him our time. In some forms, monetarily, in other forms, our actual attention. But he says, start piling up, investing your time, whether distilled in ministry or distilled into money, into heaven by investing in, in the things of God. Because moths and rust don't destroy it and thieves don't break in and steal. But here's the key. For wherever you're pouring the most precious commodity you have, which is our time. And that's why it's a tragedy that so many people give the very, uh, they're, they're kind of like a, a jet airplane that flies, you know, hops all over the country, but when they get home or get to church, it's like parking in the hangar. They are so exhausted from expending themselves, doing everything else other than their family and the church, that they have no strength left. You know, I'm, I'm not sure it's worth the extra ten or $20,000 to kill yourself at work if it totally exhausts you for family and church. What's wiser is actually going down a notch of, of see, the American dream is that we're always supposed to be making more money, having a better job, having a better house, having better education. But what we do is we lay up all of our time, our most treasured possession, in work that only is, is temporal. The Lord says, no, 
if you start investing more and more of your time with me, verse 21, where your treasure is, where you're pouring the, the most precious moments of your life, that's where your heart will be also. That's why we lose so many. If, if you pour the, the vast majority of time into sports, that's where your heart is. It's not here with God's people. It's not you know, in the Word of God, it's in the sports, or it's in the business arena, or it's in the arts arena. It's wherever we pour our, our, our most precious possession, which is our time, is where our heart is. And so the Lord says, make sure your heart is fixed on heaven. So what's interesting, now to go back, I mean, the, I, and we did last month Luke, all those seven verses about finances and money. But the bottom line of all of them is that rewards in heaven are about an attitude. It's about an attitude of doing what we're told to do, being a good servant, being a faithful servant, consistently doing what we're told to do, and being one who is sacrificially investing time. Did you know it takes time? Exactly 72 hours to read the Bible. 72 hours. Yet I would conjecture that there are people sitting here tonight that have been Christians more than a few months that have never invested 72 hours to read the whole Bible. It takes time to memorize. It takes time to study the Word of God. And when we sacrifice the convenience and comfort of, of amusements and of entertainment and of our pursuits, and we sacrifice those things to invest the time to know God through his word, to know God through the study, through the memorization, and through the meditation on his word. And then, that's just the foundation, then to go beyond that into actually doing what it says we're supposed to do. That's just the, the eating and getting the strength. And then there's the, what he wants us to do with our life. When we do that, look what he does. The Bible talks about five crowns for this attitude of wanting to know and do. And, and they are, and we're going to look at each one of them, the incorruptible crown. That's one. The crown of righteousness is a second. The crown of rejoicing is a third. The crown of glory is a fourth. And the crown of life. And each is a reward for faithfulness that starts as a hard attitude. And, and each of them are focusing on one segment of the Christian life. And let me just, I'll walk through these. Number one, the crown of life. James, that's the first New Testament epistle written by the pastor of the first church, James, the brother of our Lord, the earthly brother. Joseph and Mary had at least six children or seven. Uh, at least seven, but maybe more. Uh, Jesus, four brothers, two sisters. That's, that's how many at least they had. One of them, the oldest child after Jesus, the one that Joseph and Mary had first, was James. He wrote this epistle. James 1.12, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he'll receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised those that love him. So this crown has something to do with resisting temptation. Temptation for what? Temptation to kill yourself and invest your whole life at work. Temptation to get all enamored with sports. Temptation to constantly know everything there is to know about media and music and the internet and everything else and know less and less about God. You resist that temptation. I mean, it doesn't have to be alcohol and immorality. In fact, 99 people are addicted to everything but those things. They're addicted to television and to amusement and to recreation, and even to fitness. Their soul is unfit, but their body is very fit. And God says, resist the temptation because when you've been approved, when, it, when you are saying that, Lord, you matter more than anything else, which is what temptation is. The devil wanted Jesus to, to surrender his focus to do the will of God and start doing something else, and he resisted at every direction. You get a crown of life. Revelation 2.10 talks about it also. There are only two references to it, this crown. Do not fear those things which you are about to suffer. This is the church at Smyrna that was going through persecution. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and you have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death. I will give you the crown of life. So the crown of life either has something to do with this uh, loving the Lord or something to do with loving faithfully the Lord to the end of life or what some commentators say is that the crown of life is the one that everybody gets. It's those that persevere to the end, those that never stop believing. In other words, it's every believer 
is going to have a reward in heaven. Remember when Jesus sent out the, uh, he told the story about the farmer, I mean the, the uh, businessman that came to the workmen and hired some early in the morning and sent them out to work, and then he hired some at noon and sent them out to work, and then he came back at 4.30, and quitting time was at 5, and there was still a couple there, and he says, go out to the field. And they all go out to the field, and at the end of the day, he lines them up, and the guy that came at 4.30 got one coin. And the guy that, that came at noon got the same coin. And then the ones that were there since 8 o'clock got the same coin. And everyone started grumbling. The Lord says, hey, I can reward people any way I want. And it appears that this might be this crown of life. That no matter whether you were saved on your deathbed after a horribly, you know, wicked life or whether you came to Christ as, as a four-year-old and, and just sought him all of your days, everyone that perseveres the end by his grace gets the same reward because that only happens by loving him and serving him. So whatever you take that, that's the first crown. Here's the second one. They get very, very pointed. First Thessalonians 2.19 says, For what is our hope or joy? Ah, here it is, crown of rejoicing. And then Paul defines it, is it not even you? Who is he talking to? He's talking to the Thessalonians that he had been there three weeks in their synagogue, at least three more weeks outside the synagogue, six weeks. He had, he had preached the gospel. He had led them to Christ. He had nurtured and discipled them night and day, pouring into them all he could until he saw that they were really, truly believers following the Lord. And he had to move on. And he left Thessalonica and walked to Berea and then to Athens. And we're, we're talking about chapter 17 of Acts. This, this verse says that people we nurture, that we disciple, that we lead to Christ. Some are gifted evangelists and, and they're leading people to Christ. Others are nurturing disciplers. By the way, the evangelists in the Bible always, always teach those that they lead to Christ. So everybody is supposed to be making disciples, but some are frontliners leading them to Christ. Others are taking new believers and leading them along, or old believers never been discipled. And those people that we shape for Christ are our crown of rejoicing at the presence of our Lord Jesus that is coming. What that means is that when Christ returns, we're going to get to see everyone whose life we touched. Everyone who, who you didn't even think they were th listening in Sunday school and they were coloring the whole time and throwing paper wads, but yet they were acutely listening. They were one of those that only hears when they're active, you know, and, and they end up being shaped by your life. They're part of our crown of rejoicing. What this means is you have to actually nurture and disciple people. Look at Philippians 4.1. Therefore, my beloved, and long for brethren. This is another church. This is where Paul was pouring his life. This is the chapter before. In Acts 16, he was in Philippi. And there again, through all that the Lord did, he was able to influence people with the gospel and for them to come to Christ. And he said, you are my joy and my crown. So, the crown of rejoicing is often referred to in literature, biblical literature, as the soul winner's crown. The crown of life either is for those that are faithful unto death or it's just for all those who are saved. The second one is the soul winner's crown, those that are actually involved in people's lives spiritually. Nurturing, discipling, soul winning. Third crown is the imperishable crown. This one gets even more pointed. The context of this one is everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. He's talking about athletics. Now they do it, they compete in the, the athletic games to obtain a perishable crown. And by the way, there is nothing wrong with excelling in athletics. Nothing. It's not sin. But if excelling in athletics makes you not excel in godliness, it was wasted. Because there's no reward in heaven for being first place on every team in the world and having every trophy and having the most toned and fit body. There's no reward in heaven for that. So it's wasted time for eternity. It's fun here, but he says it's, look what he says in verse 25, it's a perishable crown. Yeah, you get crowned. Yeah, you get recognized. Yeah, you get all the, the joys of competition and everything. But he says, we, what we're working for is for the imperishable crown. Now, there is the imperishable crown. What is it? Therefore, I run, not as with uncertainty. I fight, not as one who beats the air. I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. What this crown is, is the self-discipline crown. 
This is the 1 Timothy 4, 7. Discipline yourself for godliness. There is actually a reward in heaven for those people who discipline their body, who don't live for their appetites, who don't live for whatever they want, who say no to sin, who allow the Lord to sanctify them more and more and more, who are denying, as it says in in, uh, second, or I mean in uh, Titus 2.11, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts and living soberly, righteously, and godly. And, and they might seem dull and they might seem not cool, but they're, by their spirit-energized discipline, obtaining an imperishable crown. These are the people that don't try and see how close to the edge they can get to sin. They're people that try and see how far away from sin how they can discipline themselves to say no, no, no. And they don't even want to be, as Paul said, they want to be children when it comes to sin that they don't even understand. They're not so versed in the vocabulary of evil that they know everything and nothing shocks them. They want to be shocked at sin. They discipline. They, they discipline their body and bring it into subjection, less when I preach to others. And look at this. Look at the end of that verse. Paul feared that he would become disqualified. Not lose his salvation. Adokimas is the word. And what it, what it was is if, if you have a coin, you know, if you had a, a nice big solid gold coin, if you had a file and, and you would go to the bank and get 10 coins and just do one file on the edge of that thing and get a few sprinkles of gold, you could, after about 100 or 200 coins, you could have stolen a little bit from all those coins. And so they made a rule in the ancient world that any coin that showed any type of, of filing at all was a dokimas. It was rejected. It was no longer a valuable coin for what it had to be re-melted and, and weighed and everything else if there was any sign of cutting the corners. So Paul said, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. Uh, what what it's an interesting word. What he says is, I knock myself out. I don't let my body, in fact, I, I've told you many times when I used to travel with Dr. MacArthur, he had this curious habit of always leaving, uh, if we were to stake place, he'd always leave the very center, the most perfectly tender part. It was like a little column. And he used to leave it sitting on his plate. He'd eat all the way around it and leave it. And I said, what are you doing? And he says, I'm teaching my body. It's not running things. I mean, he'd eat his hot fudge sundae, and he'd leave one hole down the side from the hot fudge, the nuts, and the whipped cream all the way up, and he'd leave that in the dish. I'd say, what are you doing? You're wasting. There are children dying in India, my mother told me. He says, no, I am teaching my body that it's not running the show. See, he had his own little ways of, of beating his body into submission. So that's the imperishable crown. That's the self-discipline crown. Here's another one. In 2 Timothy 4, 8, it's called the crown of righteousness. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me, but all who have loved his appearing. Now, this is coming back to Christ's parables. And Jesus told the parables about the servants who were serving the master, but when the master was gone, they went back to their old ways, and they didn't do what they were told to do, and they didn't keep up what he asked them to do. They just did whatever they wanted to do. And when the master came, he found them not doing what he left them doing, and they were not good servants. And Paul said, I am so aware of Christ's coming that I want to be found by him doing what he left me to do. It's not like out of sight, out of mind. He's saying you're always in my mind even though you're out of sight because, and look what it says, because I love, I'm looking for you. I long, I love your appearing. And there's a crown for people who go through life saying, yeah, I'm away from home, nobody sees me, but the Lord sees me and he might come. And they're like Jonathan Edwards who said, resolved, he used to make these resolves, you know, the 300 and some year ago, Jonathan Edwards. He said, resolved never to be found doing anything that I would not want to be found doing by Christ at his return. That was a good resolution. That's this resolution. This is the crown of righteousness. There's a crown of righteousness that the righteous judge gives me when I and others who are embracing this love his appearing so much that I am doing what he left me to do until he comes or calls. And then there's one more. This is called the crown of glory. 
Uh, it's, it's Peter talks about this one. The elders who are among you I exhort, whom a fellow elder, Peter didn't think, have any heirs. He didn't think he was special. He certainly didn't think that he was the vicar of Christ. He was a fellow elder with everybody else. He was a witness of the sufferings of Christ. He was a partaker. He, he had this personal relationship and walk with the Lord. And this is what he said, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, but serve the flock not by compulsion, do it willingly and you'll get a reward, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly loving to serve the flock, not as being lords over those entrusted to you like you're the great poobah, but by being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, here's a reward, you will receive a crown of glory that doesn't fade away. The unfading crown of glory is for shepherding, nurturing, teaching, pastoring, uh, poimen is the word for uh, shepherd, for being one who not merely oversees the, the, you know, the mechanics of it all, but actually gets involved with the lives of believers, of Christ's sheep. And those that serve Christ's church have a crown of glory. Now, we need to make choices that keep us from wasting our lives. So what do we have to do? Well, God wants us to invest our lives in a special way. How do we do that? Philippians 3, uh, this, this is the idea of, of making a choice. But what things were gained to me, Paul said, I had so many things I was interested in, but I plan to neglect those. I count them but loss for Christ. In fact, he says, everything is loss compared to the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. I've suffered the loss of all things. I count everything on earth as rubbish so that I can gain Christ. He says, all I'm living for is what my master wants me to do when he comes back. And he says, that's what totally circumscribes my life. Well, what would keep us from getting treasures and crowns? Well, the Lord tells us. Uh, he said that the sum in the church in, in uh, Laodicea, in Revel uh, yeah, chapter 3 of Revelation there, they were rich, they became wealthy, they didn't need anything, and they became blind and naked spiritually. They didn't see Christ every day. They, their hearts were not panting after him like a, a deer pants after the water. They did not see the land that was far off. Their eyes were not just focused on the word, and it was not sweeter than honey. And therefore, they were not being clothed with the righteous acts of saints. You know, Revelation 19 tells us part of what we're going to wear in heaven is the righteous acts. It's like everything prompted by the Spirit of God that we did that's righteous in God's sight is part of what we will forever wear. It's part of this reward. They were missing out on that. And what causes that, and I'll just start this, I'm so glad a high schooler was thinking at this level so I could answer it, but I just put in the normal things that keep us from getting rewards in heaven. I call them pathogens. And here's the first one, a lust for comfort and convenience. Did you know that's kind of epidemic in America? We continually, as Americans, lust for comfort. I mean, you gotta have higher thread counts. I mean, you want the, the absolute softest, smoothest, and a life consumed with a lust for comfort. And convenience won't finish well. Why? Because the Bible says endure hardness as a good soldier. It doesn't say have the absolute cushiest, convenient, comfortable life possible. To be a servant of Christ is inconvenient. Yet you have to work with people that don't smell good, that don't act good, that, that don't say things that are comfortable to well-adjusted people. And, and what the Lord says, behold, I'm coming quickly, hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. There is this subtle undertone all the way through the scripture of losing, not salvation, rewards. There's this, this, this undercurrent. Uh, covetousness for security. Our whole country is security obsessed. We're caught up in the pursuit of security and we waste valuable time and energy protecting things we can't keep. See, what the Lord says is if you give them to me, you don't have to worry about them. And, and 1 John 2 says, Now, little children, abide in him that when he appears we may have confidence and not be ashamed. What is this ashamed? Both John and Peter and Paul 
all saw that they had been entrusted with the, the greatest resource they have, their time, and they weren't to squander their primary investment of time on themselves, but on Christ and his desires. His desires for marriage, his desire for the home, his desire for the church, his desire for being a Christian in the world, but not primarily securing my time so I can just do and live and be and have everything I want to be. And, and here's the last one for communion. There's a greed for recognition that erases rewards. And you can see it right there in Matthew 6, 2, 5, and 16. And it seems almost everyone lusts for the applause of others. We must be aware of seeking the approval from people instead of seeking approval only from God. You see, if, Jesus says, if what you do, you do to be seen, and if you do it in such a way, you'll be seen. If you do it in such a way, you'll be noticed. And if you do it in such a way, you'll be recognized and rewarded on earth. He says, you've just erased the heavenly half of that work. I mean, it's great you did it on earth, and that's your reward. And it's only here. And you did that, and everyone thought you were great. Good. You got the, you feel great. You've erased the other half of the ticket in heaven. There's no claim check that you're going to have something from that. And what he said is, if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. If it was done in pride, if it was done for, for self-aggrandizement, but he will be saved, but through fire. What are treasures in heaven? What will we do with them? So basically, we're talking about the rewards and the basis of rewards and this, this evening, how to lose rewards, because Paul feared losing his reward. Paul, St. Paul that wrote half the New Testament, feared losing his rewards. That's a sobering thought. And then what are we going to do with them, which is about worship. We start in Matthew, treasures uh, in heaven are for good and faithful servants. That's what the Lord said. He gives them to those who are good. That means they do what he asks them to do. Faithful, they continue to do it. Uh, it's so we don't waste our life. We saw that last time. Jesus said, I'm coming quickly. My reward is with me. Uh, he is, uh, in all of his parables, he was... Uh, portraying himself as, as going to the workmen and paying them on the spot for their, their labor. And, and we are not earning our way to heaven, but we do earn rewards in heaven, and that is only by his grace, but for faithful obedience, according to his work, it says in Revelation 22. What we do with them, we saw last time, representative of the 24, and we talked all about the number 24 and the 12 and 12 and all of that, but Traditionally, the 24 elders represent all saints, and the Bible defines a saint as a born-again person who has been sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And so all saints of all ages are represented by the 24 elders, and we take our crowns, the, the distillation of our life, and we, we cast them at Christ's feet. Now that metaphor, casting at his feet, is a metaphor from history. In the time, the lifetime of the Apostle Paul, Nero, the bad guy, the one that murdered his mother and murdered his wives and, and, you know, stamped a slave to death on the sidewalk, he was a very gruesome, not only looked grotesque, but he acted grotesque. But he was the emperor, the supreme emperor of Rome, of the empire. And during his time, the Parthians... Uh, made an overture to Rome. And so Nero made this big event, spent a lot of money. It's, it's recorded in the annals of the Roman Empire. And the king of Parthia came, and during the time of the apostle Paul and of John, the Parthian king took his crown off and laid it at Nero's feet. And that concept was saying that you are worthy, that you are greater, you are higher. Actually, all he did is buy time so the Roman legions wouldn't come and attack Parthia so they could be strengthened, and Rome ended up never conquering them. But this ploy, uh, the Apostle John takes that, that sight that people, it was immortalized. They had a play that traveled the empire with an actor portraying the king of Parthia and another one portraying Nero, and the Parthian fell down on his knees, put his face down, and put his crown at the feet of Nero. And that so moved Nero that he didn't attack him, and the rest is history. Uh, Christ says this, our treasures are laid to what we do with our, 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 our treasures on earth are related to what we invest them in. Here relates to how it will be in heaven. So Jesus said, where we put our treasure, our heart follows it. And so he said, invest it with me 
And uh, then I went through the crowns, but some of you said that I commented too fast and didn't write them down, so I added the crowns. Uh, the five that we talked about, the first one, the crown of life, I, and, and there's the two places it shows up, James 1.12 and Revelation 2.10. I personally believe, and some commentators believe, that this is a crown everyone gets, that no one will be crownless in heaven, that everyone is rewarded with the crown of life, which is endless life, eternal life. And, and part of that is the perseverance of saints, that's in Revelation 2.10, and the fact that those who are saved love the Lord with all their heart. And that's the two elements that, that uh, is included in this crown of life, but it probably portrays uh, those who are saved. The second crown, the crown of rejoicing, which is mentioned twice, is the soul winner's crown. In the Old Testament, it, it says, he that winneth souls is wise, in the Proverbs. And in Daniel, it says, those that, that turn many toward righteousness will shine with a magnitude. It uses a, an astrophysical term for a magnitude. You know, in heaven, or in the skies, as you look out at the stars, they're all different magnitudes. 1 Corinthians 15 mentions that, that we'll all have varying degrees of reflections of his glory. So basically, one of the aspects of these crowns are kind of our uh, luminescence or our reflectivity, whatever you want to call it, that the greater capacity that we had on earth of glorifying the Lord will be reflected in heaven with how much we reflect that glory. So what it says in Daniel chapter 12, that those who are involved in soul winning, in every dimension of soul winning, whether it's the, the praying for those that go out, whether it's the actual, uh, as we have people here, that we have one uh, uh, dear faithful woman who comes to the office, gets the tracks, takes them, puts a little sticker on the back and prays over all of them and delivers them back so that we can fill the racks. She has prayed that every one of those, rat, those tracks will go out to someone, but it takes a hand to take them and, you know, to fold, put in the wallet or your purse or in your pocket and to take it out. Everybody that's a part of the process, 1 Corinthians 3 says, is rewarded. Paul said, some sow, some water, God gives the increase. Really, there's no one that, that in the ultimate sense, saves people. God saves them. He uses instruments to present the gospel and, and ask him to pray. He uses instruments that, that provide the track. He, he uses instruments that pray for the process and people that even, uh, you know, make the process even possible. All of us are participants. It's kind of like a, a, a garden where, where one person rototills, another person mulches, you know, another person puts the seeds in, the other one turns the sprinkler on, and then they all enjoy, you know, all the wonderful tomatoes or whatever. So the crown of rejoicing is soul winning. And Paul said there's something interesting. He said all the people that he ministered to his whole ministry time, when he gets to heaven, are going to be his crown of rejoicing. So it appears that there's going to be a correspondence that we're going to know who we had a part of. Like, like Jeff said about Mark and Marcia's ministry, that only in heaven will we see those that were touched through their ministry that we were a part of the connection God's going to do. He's going to let us see what happened for all those people that we prayed for, all those people we supported, and, and uh, missionaries that, that, that we never really knew or even met. They were off in the distance or those we knew up close and who they led to the Lord and all that he did. Paul calls that a crown of rejoicing. And he says again in Philippians, in that verse at the bottom, my joy, that speaks of the eternal joy that, that starts now and goes on that, that we're a part of bringing someone to the Lord, but my crown. And that's the reflection of, of uh, the Lord's blessing in, in a soul coming. The imperishable crown is for disciplined living. Now this one I just have to go through word by word. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Paul's talking about an athletic metaphor. Then he says they do it to get this this olive or laurel wreath crown that would dry out, be brittle, and fall apart. Think of a rose that you dry and, you know, it falls over and, it, you know, it just crumbles. That's what they do for a perishable crown. But we, so the Olympics, he said, is perishable. We do it for a crown that will never perish. It won't get brittle and dry up. Verse 26, here's the essence. Therefore, I run thus not with uncertainty. I fight, not as one who beats the air. But I, and, and what he's doing here is he's using the different sports. He's writing this to Corinth. Corinth is on the isthmus 
between the Peloponnesus and the mainland. And that part of Greece, which is still there today, is very narrow. In fact, the, the Corinthian Canal goes through there where you can save uh, uh, quite a haul going around all the reefs of Greece. You can cut straight through the Corinthian Canal. It's there today. But it was a short spot of land, and Corinth was astride so that ships on both sides did trade with Corinth. And so Paul used the metaphor that the athletic events, the, the feeder game for the Olympics, the original Olympics, the feeder game was called the Pan-Isthmian, Isthmus. So Pan, all, Isthmian games. And they fed people into the Olympics. And right here he says, running, and they had many running races, uh, fighting, and, and they had many, and you've seen the Olympic symbols from the, the early Greek Olympics, not as one who just is, is beating the air, but look at verse 27. This is a boxing term. And he says, but I, and, and in English it says discipline the body. The Greek word is hupiadzo, and what hoop, hupo means below or beneath or under, and apiadzo, like optometrist, has to do with the eye. And a hupiadzo is to hit someone. Remember, I grew up with a golden gloves boxing dad, and I saw him do it. Uh, he knew just where to hit someone, and, and they would just go unconscious. I mean, just, and they're out. That's the word Paul uses. He says, I know where my weakness is, and I know how to knock out my flesh. I know how to starve it. I know how to mortify it. I know how to deny ungodliness. And he says, I discipline my body. I hit myself under the eye. Now, he's not talking about, you know, this, this uh, kind of person wants to harm themselves. He's not, this is not talking about that kind of a person, a person that is injuring their body. He's talking about spiritual disciplines, that I know how to discipline my body and bring it into subjection. That's a fascinating word. That word means to follow like a slave. He says, I make my body follow like a slave, my spirit. Now, in the marketplace, the master, the Roman master, who was the rich, you know, aristocratic person, would walk through the market, and they weren't constantly doing what we used to have to do when children are little, saying, come on, come on, stay, follow me, come on, come on, come on, come on back, come on, hold my hand, come on. A slave follows like a slave. They're right behind their master. And if the master lifts something up, they're right there to get it. If the master's taking the coat off, they're right there. And he said, my body is not running my life. My spirit, born from above, is running my life, and it is making the body follow like a slave. You say, uh-huh, what is that? Your body doesn't want to get up in the morning and read the Bible. Your body wants to stay up late and do other things. You have to have, and, and I used to say this when I was a youth pastor, mind over mattress, okay? <laughs> and you have to tell your body who is in control. And you have to say, no, we are getting up, we are getting this discipline, we are going to spend time, we are going to do that, we are not going to do the desires of the flesh. We are going to do what the Spirit of God is prompting. And, and Paul says it right there. I bring my body to follow me like a slave. And so in other words, Paul's heart, his mind, his spirit was headed off in the mission field and his body beaten from the jail, in the stocks, with all the stripes, followed like a slave. Whereas if his body was running things, it would say, uh-uh, you know, not going to do this, not going to get beaten again. Paul said, no, my body is enslaved to following Christ. But this is why. Look at the end of the verse. Lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. That word disqualified doesn't mean lose salvation. Losing salvation is not a biblical concept. It's a... It's a misinterpretation of a couple of passages, uh, and it totally denies the clear ones. For example, the Lord says, Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling. My salvation is not based on me holding on, but on Christ holding me. Paul said, I don't want to be disqualified. Now, I told you last time, it was when, when they shave the edges of gold coins as an example of the use of that. Just by taking a little few grains off of a golden coin, and if you did it long enough, you'd amass uh, some free gold, it ruined the coin you did it to. And Paul said, I don't want to ruin my reward by cutting corners. That's why in the scriptures, it's not how you begin, it's how you what? 
end that matters. Yeah. You hear all these people that say, I want to end well. That's a very biblical concept. That's what Paul said. I want to finish the course the Lord has laid out for me. I want to run the whole race. I want to stay. And he uses the, the metaphor here. You became disqualified in the Greek games if you stepped over the line of your lane in the race. You know, kind of t- trying to cut the corners, which has become epidemic in our culture. Everybody cuts corners. Well, it's okay to cut corners across grass, you know. I mean, it's just grass, but you don't cut corners spiritually and, and, and break the, the restrictions that the Lord's made. So Paul goes on and talks about another crown. And, and this is the fourth crown. It's the crown of righteousness, and it's only given to people who are servants that realize they have a master, and while they're doing their serving, they realize the master could come at any moment. In fact, the Apostle John, I didn't put it in here, but he talks about this. He says, Lord, let me not be ashamed before you at your coming, in 1 John 2. He said, I don't want to be found not doing what you asked me to do. And I I told you about Jonathan Edwards, the the Puritan divine, the the great mind that he was, scholar, and the one who started the Great Awakening. He wrote, I resolve that I'll never be found as a servant doing something I would not want my master to find me doing at his coming. That's what this crown is for. There's laid up for me the crown of righteousness. So it's me living a righteous life because I love my master, not because I'm afraid of being punished or I'm afraid of getting caught. It's because I know he's watching me. You know what this is called in the Old Testament? That working because I know the Lord's watching me is called the fear of the Lord. It's this reverence for God that that I can live every day like Jesus is watching me and could find me at any moment and I wouldn't be ashamed of what he finds me doing. That's a great way to live. That, that is a transformational way to live and Paul to the Thessalonians called it, the word is amemtas in Greek. It means to be without uh, anything that would cause rot. It, 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 amemtas, uh, the the concept in Greek is that that there's nothing that would cause rottenness. There's no hidden secret. You know, in in Ecclesiastes 5, it talks about uh, a bug in the ointment. We don't allow bugs. We don't allow things into our life that will rot and corrode and, and, and be unpleasant to our master. And there's a reward for that. The Lord, the righteous judge, Paul said, will give it to me on that day, and not to me only, but everyone who loves his appearing. So as soon as you choose to say, thou, God, seest me, what I'm doing, as much as is humanly possible, by your Spirit's power and through your grace, I'm doing what you left me to do. I love your appearing. I know you're going to come at any moment. There's a crown for that. And here's the last one. It's in 1 Peter 5, and it's the shepherding crown. And it's for shepherding the flock of God, which is among you. And, And it's targeted at those who sacrifice. You know, every time I meet with the elders, and I meet with the elders a lot, I think about the fact that they're working 50 hour plus weeks and they're investing hours and hours and hours. I mean, I just popped in after one meeting on Thursday night into my office at about, I don't know, seven o'clock. It was all full of elders, you know, and some deacons and they were working away. And I said, well, what are we working on tonight? And, and there's an investment in the flock. Look at this verse. When you, when you poimane, when you shepherd the flock of God, that is among you when you serve as an overseer, not because you were forced to, but you want to, not because you're going to gain some, you know, like politicians do, some kickback or graft or something, not for dishonest gain, but because you eagerly are doing it for your master, not being the pooba, you know, the, the pope over them, those entrusted to you, but being, look at this, examples to the flock. See, the most powerful part of shepherding is not doing what I say, but doing what I do. And when an elder's life corresponds, in other words, when they don't try to live up to what they're teaching, but they teach what they're living, when they actually, there's a correspondence there, and their character is that which 1 Corinthians 11 one says, that you can be an imitator of me like I am of Christ. When that happens, look what the Lord does. When you are examples to the flock, verse 4, then when the chief shepherd 
See, verse 2 says we're under shepherds. We are not the shepherds of the flock. Christ is, but we're working under him, remember, as servants, knowing he's watching. And when that relationship goes on and, and our work is to be an example, look what he does. When the chief shepherd appears, you, faithful under shepherds, will receive the crown of glory that's unfading. And, and part of that Daniel 12 verse is those that turn many to righteousness. That is not just, the goal is not just to have as many people pray the prayer so, you know, they have fire insurance and are, you know, not going to go to hell, but they turn to righteousness. See, God is not just looking for people to fill the boat. He wants us to glorify him. Sanctification is increasing my capacity to whether I eat or drink or whatever I do, I glorify him. And that's those that nurture people that way and exemplify that by their, their, their objectives in life, by their disciplines, by their character, and by what they teach lining up. When, when their life lines up and it, it is a nurturing life for the flock, the Lord says, you have a crown that will never fade that means it's going to be bright forever. So we need to make the choices that keep us from wasting our life. So let's talk about wasting our life. Paul said there are things in life that are not wrong, but I, I'm not going to let them get in the way. Roman, or I mean, uh, Hebrews 12 talks about them tripping us up. It, it's kind of like uh, we were having a meeting. I've been involved in a year-long Bible study with a group of people that have been intensely reading the New Testament, the life of Christ, and, and uh, the Gospels and Acts, and, and, and doing a geographic, chronological study of the New Testament because they're going to Israel. And we had our finale on Friday night, and we were there, and one of the, the uh, people going is an ardent hiker. And they said, let me look through your bag, anybody here, because I'll throw out half your stuff. I know what you don't need. Did you know that's... You know, if you've ever hiked and carried a pack, you know that you don't need a lot of stuff. And if you're really good at it, you narrow it down because you're going to be carrying every ounce. When you get that hiker mentality as a pilgrim going to heaven, you shed. Look what Paul says. What things were gained to me, those I've counted lost for Christ. They were hindering me. There's nothing wrong with them. I mean, collecting all kinds of stuff and, and amassing all kinds of stuff. There's really nothing wrong with having a lot of stuff as long as you don't worship it, and as long as it doesn't get in the way of the Lord. But you know what it is? It's a weight. And, and the Lord says, the Apostle Paul so drew his heart, Christward, responding to God's grace, that he says, I'm counting all this stuff as loss. In fact, he says in verse 8, I count everything like loss, like rubbish, he said, it's kind of like I'm getting ready to go and move into the, the, the better place, and I'm not going to take any of this old stuff with me. I don't want any of that. It's an encumbrance. You know, there's, it's just a bother. He said, that's how I look at the spiritual life. For the excellency of knowing Christ, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things, I count everything I've lost like rubbish because I have one thing I want, and that's Christ. And when you think about it, Christ is the only thing you can't lose. You can lose friends. You can lose possessions. You can lose mobility but you can't lose Christ. And he said, I, I'm focusing on that. And so what would keep us then? What, so that's positive. You, just kind of, you don't have any encumbrances. But what are the negatives that we can do as believers? Well, we went through these. Uh, in Revelation 3, spiritual blindness produced by prosperity is a very great danger. And it's probably the biggest one in America. When we're rich, at the beginning of that verse, become wealthy, and don't need anything. You don't need to pray all night long for anything. You've got enough money to buy it. You don't need to worry about, you know, providing. You've got it all. You don't need to trust the Lord for daily bread. You've got years of bread. The Lord says, watch out. There's nothing wrong with having years of bread. There's something wrong with not needing the Lord. And the more we don't need the Lord, it's like spiritual cataracts. And we become blind. And when we're blind, we don't realize that we're naked. In other words, we're not clothed uh, with what Revelation 19 says are our works. Now, now we, we're totally saved by the righteousness of Christ, but we are going to forever reflect our works. In fact, for a moment, look at Revelation 19, because a lot of people, you know, nice that you said that, I don't believe it, I've never seen it. Okay, well, let's look at it, okay? It says in Revelation 19 in verse 8, 
talking about the church. Now, now who is that? It's in verse 7. Be glad and rejoice, Revelation 19, 7. And give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. Now listen to this. This is fascinating. And to her, the wife, the church, the believers, the saints, to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. Now here's the interesting line. Fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. That's really interesting. You know, all of us are going to have the robe of righteousness, Christ imputed righteousness. But this linen, the linen were the, the inner garments. Those are what we were, our righteous acts. And some people are naked, it says here. They, they aren't doing anything for the Lord, they're saved. That's it. They're living life the way they want. And the Lord says, hmm, buy from me gold refined in the fire. Get something valuable. Okay, what are the things that, that erase uh, our rewards? The first one I called a pathogen, you know, kind of like a dangerous uh, germ. Is an unforsaken desire. Here's one, lust for comfort. And it says in Revelation 3.11, uh, the Lord said, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have. Let no one take your crown. The context of that verse is don't let the cares of this world and the, the desire for comfort, for convenience, for, for desiring things and all that things produce. Uh, remember what 1 John 2 says? Uh, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father. It's of the world. And... and Whoever loves those things, the love of the Father is not in him. Those things, that the, the longing for this world makes us lose our reward. Uh, here's another one, the covetousness for security. Uh, and we talked about this last time. And, and when we are not needing the Lord, trusting the Lord, when we're not seeing him uh, deliver us from the evil one, uh, especially whatever form the evil one takes of anxiety or fears or, or of, you know, desires that don't please him. When, we, when we're self-sufficient and we're covetous to secure ourselves in whatever means, it's possible, and this is what John said, now little children, that's the verse at the bottom of the screen, abide in him that when he appears we may have confidence. The confidence of knowing that we were going through life saying, not that I'm sufficient of myself to think anything of myself, but my sufficiency is of God. If we don't have that, we'll be ashamed before him at his coming. And the next verse says there at the bottom, we will suffer loss. And there's loss for people. Pride is one thing, and the Lord addresses that in that Matthew 6, 2, 5, and 16 verses. He says, when you do what you do to be seen because of pride, you lost any future reward for that. You just... That's a zeroed out. And that will show up, 1 Corinthians 3.15, at the fire when we suffer loss and our works are burned up. Well, we covered that last week. Exceptionism is where we ended up last time. And exceptionism is when I think I'm an exception to the rule. When I say, yeah, that, that rule, uh, like this one, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, talking to Christians, by the mercies of God, if you've ever experienced the mercies of God, that you present your body in fact, yesterday, after the homegoing celebration for Ron Petrosky, someone waited in line and asked me, they said, now, this body we're in right now, is going to be, this one is going to be resurrected? I said, mm -hmm. yeah. You're not going to get, you know, uh, whoever you think has the perfect body, you know, like they've just discovered Clint Eastwood's son, if you see the news. It's like he just began to exist and everyone's, Gaga over a new Clint Eastwood that kind of is perfect, that rugged look, you know. You're not going to get Clint Eastwood's son's body, you know, or whatever, you know, current woman that is. This body is the body we're forever going to have. It's just going to be changed from terrestrial to celestial. And it's going to be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of the eye. And the Lord is going to raise the body that is sown in dishonor, that is corruptible, that goes back to the dust. But the Lord is going to keep track of all the dust. He's going to reconstitute this body. And he's going to make it celestial. 
It's going to be clothed with immortality. But look what he says. Present that body that you're forever going to have that belongs to the Lord and present it to God as a living sacrifice. Say, I'm, I'm offering more and more and more and more on the altar of myself every day. I got all of you at the instant of salvation, but you don't have all of me. It's kind of like, you know, you win the big war, then you have to do the infantry really is what wins. You have to do the ground work to actually sow the, the conquest up. God says, I have all of you, or I mean, you got all of me, but now I want to conquer every part of your life and, and be a part. And that's by us presenting our body to him wholly acceptable, which is our, our reasonable service, which is the word for lutreo, uh, for, for worship. It's an offering of worship. But look at verse 2. And don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Did you notice back in this verse, you, you present your reasonable service. You know, it's individual. Renew your mind. You prove what is a good and acceptable. And there are people that exceptionism means, yeah, that's for some, that's, that's for the people going, you know, to the, those short-term trips that Jeff's talking about where they fall in love and go on and serve the Lord. That's not for, that's an except, I'm an exception to that rule. It's not me that's supposed to give sacrificially. It's not me that's supposed to, you know, not live by bread alone but by every word of God. And I'm an exception to all those things about being crucified with Christ. That's a problem. Exceptionism is rampant in the church. Everyone says, that's talking about that person. That's talking about that person. That's not me. That's them. I'm an exception to all those calls to sacrifice. Then there's another one. I call it unmortified pockets of pride. There are three of them. An unmortified pocket of pride means allowing pride to grow so you make, it makes you secretly, inwardly proud of your intellect. You think you're smarter than others. Look at James 4.10. Uh, it's just amazing what the Lord loves. And in James chapter 4 and verse 10, he said this, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he'll lift you up. Pockets of pride in our life can erase Christ's well done. God hates pride. Humble yourselves. In fact, Colossians 3.12 says to clothe. We're supposed to put on humility. It's like a garment. You put it on. It's a choice. It's a conscious choice. Unmortified pockets of pride also means that pride can grow and make us secretly inwardly proud of our achievements. We don't just think we're better. We're, we think that, that everything is because of us. Now, let, let me read to you 1 Corinthians 4, 7. This is a, a wonderful verse that should be worn out in our Bibles because it reminds us of the reality of how God assesses us. And it says in verse 7, Who makes you differ from another? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? You know what the blessing is? Is to realize anything good that comes from us is the Lord. We don't produce. Remember what James says? That, that, that you can't have out of, out of a fall in life anything good. It, the fountain produces what's in the heart. And the only reason my fountain brings forth sweet water and not bitter is because I have a new fountain from the Lord. I have a new heart. And so what do I have that I didn't receive? And how can I boast or glorify myself? And this idea is proudly thinking that I am somehow, because God has blessed me, better than someone else, as if I'm the one producing the blessing. See, that's a deficient view of the power of the Spirit. So we can be proud of our achievements and we can be proud of our goodness, thinking I'm not as bad as others. This is terrible. Look what Paul thought about himself. In fact, for, uh, Romans chapter 7 is a fascinating chapter in the Bible. It's the marks of the life of a true, truly mature believer because that's what Paul was. Most people think that Romans 7 is the, the, the flesh. Well, that's what we deal with our whole life. And a truly mature person uh, sees themselves brokenly seeing their flesh evident in their life and they, they are, have no trust in their own goodness. And look at, at verse uh, 18. For I know that in me, Romans 7, 18, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not do, that I practice. For if I 
uh, do what I will not do. It is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. And what Paul is talking about is this, this awareness we have of the power of the flesh. And what he says is, I can't ever be proud of my goodness because I don't have any. Anything I have is imputed to me by Christ. I was not born innately good. I was born innately evil. And so if an innately evil person does something good, it's not because of them. So I, I don't have any problem with it. I mean, uh, I have a regular occurrence of people coming up, and, and they'll say, wow, that was wonderful. I said, well, praise the Lord. They said, yeah, but you did a good job. I said, anything good was the what? The Lord. See, but we take credit for all the bad. And that's, that's this idea. So, so look at the essence, the bottom paragraph. Sin in the light of sin never does look bad. When we live in the comparative degree and say, well, I'm not as bad as they are, I'm not, as, I'm not that bad, that, that we always win that way because we can always find someone that's worse than us. But look what we're supposed to do. Sin in the light of God's holiness always looks really bad. We don't compare ourselves with others, 1 Corinthians 4, 7. We look at how far short we fall from the glory of God. We, like Paul, confess that within me dwells no good thing. My flesh without the, the sanctifying, mortifying power of the Spirit, can do any sin. My flesh can. And so I have to say, nothing good dwells in me. It's Christ. And then I surrender, and that's where the whole Romans 12 comes in. Okay, so why? And, and uh, oh, why should we each focus on being good and faithful servants? I told you, Martin Luther said, I have only two days on my calendar today, and the day I stand before Christ. So real quickly, look at 2 Corinthians 5.10. And this I know is a familiar passage, but I want you to think about it, especially we've been in, in the book of Revelation so much. Think about the amazing moment that we get to stand in front of Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, we appear before his judgment seat, and we receive the things done in the, what? Body. See, our body matters to God. Our body is to be his temple. Our body is to be his living sacrifice. Our body is to be, as Romans 6 says, an instrument of righteousness. My body is supposed to be held by the Lord to do righteous things. We're like, you know, a, a clean spoon stirring in the kitchen. Not a dirty one, a clean one, an instrument that can be used for righteous things. If we are impure he can't use us as he wants to he has to set us aside that's what it says in first timothy if we're a vessel that is not pure it's it's one that is set aside he only uses the the vessels that are pure that are usable so that's why we have to repent and be cleansed but look what happens in second corinthians 5 10 we're going to appear phanerothenai is the greek word there which, which means we may manifest before the judgment seat of Christ, the raised bema seat of Christ, that each one, the word is hesketon, one by one, we receive the things done in our body according to what we have done, whether good or bad. Now remember, bad doesn't mean sin, because there is no condemnation for sin we'll ever face. Justification means God has forgiven, and he put the penalty for it on Christ, and when he put the penalty as if Christ committed our sin, he put the record there with it. So there's no record on file of all my sins. That's, that's wonderful. But what is the bad then in verse 10? It's when I waste my life. And what I'd like to do for the last eight minutes before it's time to go, I'd like to read from one of my favorite books, from one of my favorite living authors. His name is John Piper. This is one of my favorite stories, and I'll read it to you. It's right in the middle of his book about investing our lives with Christ. And he said, the chapter is these lives and deaths were not tragedy. In April of 2000, Ruby Eliason and Laura Edwards were killed in Cameroon, West Africa. Ruby was over 80, single all her life. She poured it out for one great thing to make Christ known among the unreached, the poor, and the sick. Laura was a widow, a medical doctor pushing 80 years old. Now, in, in 2000, to be an 80-year-old medical doctor, she had to have been in the higher income spectrum of the country. She should have been in a gated community in Florida somewhere with extremely good medical care, with one of those climate-controlled vehicles that is, you know, you can't crash in them and they steer themselves. She was down in Cameroon, pushing 80. That's dangerous. I mean, you need to sleep in your own bed and, and not get a cold so you can live longer. 
and she was serving at Ruby's side in Cameroon. And the brakes of the car failed. Do you know why? I mean, I've been a pastor 35 years. Almost every church I've pastored has had a missionary house. Do you know what most churches have in their missionary houses? What nobody else wants. What cars do they donate? They donate them when they're on their last breath. Give them to the missionaries, you know. We don't want to, we're going to drive the new car. Give the missionary the old car. Well, they must have gotten one of those cars because the car went over the cliff and they were both killed instantly. Now, Piper says this. I asked my congregation up at Bethlehem in Minneapolis, was that a tragedy? The people back home would have said, yeah, I, she shouldn't have been there. She's over 80. Probably she had a mini stroke or something, you know? You know, shouldn't have been there. Piper adds, two lives driven by one great passion, namely to be spent in unheralded service. Why? Because Matthew 6 says if everybody pats you on the back, that's the only reward you're going to get. Unheralded service receives great reward. To be spent in unheralded service to the perishing poor for the glory of Jesus Christ. Now look at this. Now Piper, I wouldn't say this because it would offend people, but he does. They were in Africa even two decades after most of their American counterparts had retired to throw away their life on trifles. Now, what is a trifle? It's something that won't matter a thousand years from today. Think about something you're fussing and worrying and guarding and, and anxious and can't sleep at night over that won't matter in a thousand years. Basically, the only thing that will be around in a thousand years are people and whatever's done for Christ. Everything else will burn up. Everything. Trifles. They threw away their lives on trifles. Piper goes on, no, that's not tragedy. That is a glory. These lives were not wasted. These lives were not lost. Jesus said this, it is in bold, whoever loses his life, how we get rewarded in heaven is not having the capacity to do anything that pleases us on earth. We're limited because we sacrifice for Christ. Our time. See, did you know you can tell your spiritual condition by what you do in your amusement recreational time is it all for me is it what i want am i just acquiring all of the the fun things so i can post them and let everybody see them and and then be envious of theirs so i can go out and try and outdo them or am i look at this whoever loses his life for my sake doesn't mean you have to die you die daily you limit for christ and the Gospels, now see, it's not, this is not just rigid asceticism. It's not just getting skinny as a rail and starving yourself for, for ascetic reasons. It's for the Gospel. They didn't go to Cameroon just for the clinic. They went to tell the people in the clinic the Gospel of Jesus Christ. That's how you save your life. Now, this is the interesting part in Piper's book, An American Tragedy, How Not to Finish Your One Life. Piper says, I will tell you what a tragedy is. I will show you how to waste your life. Consider the story from February 98 edition of Reader's Digest, which tells about a couple who took early retirement from their jobs in the Northeast five years ago. So that was in 93 at the height of the tech boom in New England. And he was 59, she was 51. They cashed out. Now they live in Punta Gorda, Florida, where they cruise on their 30-foot trawler, play softball, and collect seashells. Piper says, at first when I read it, I thought it might be a joke, a kind of a spoof on the American dream, but it wasn't. Tragically, this was the dream. Come to the end of your life, your one and only precious God-given life, and let the last great work of your life, those last years, the greatest years, when you're at the height of everything, you finally have learned what life is all about. You prom most Americans over 50 are at the highest income level they'll ever be. Come to that last great time of your life before you give an account of your creator and let it be this, playing softball and collecting shells. Piper says, picture them before Christ on the great day of judgment as they stand if they were believers, before him and say, look, Lord, I got one of every kind of shell from the Gulf. And he goes, hmm. Now, think about kneeling before Jesus. Paul said this. This is what clarifies, and I'm glad our teenagers are thinking about such stuff and write this on offering envelopes. 
For we'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, Romans 14.10 says. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me, every tongue will confess to God. Then Paul says, so each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Be sure you invest the rest of your life with God. How do you know it's invested with God? What you invest will still be valuable in a thousand years and ten and a hundred thousand years. That's all that's worth living for. Have you ever thought of that? How much of your life, how much of my life is that? Now you say, wait a minute, does that mean we just read the Bible and memorize and chant Gregorian chants all day? No. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, you do it as a living sacrifice to the glory of God. So I thought a great way to end tonight would be to sing the blind poet's hymn. Helen Lemel wrote this. And this was her method of living that life ready for the judgment seat. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and everything else will do.